Young man, there's a place you can go. I said, young man, when you're short on your dough, you can stay there, and I'm sure you will find many ways to have a good time. Quoth the village people. 1978. This is actually just my book. You can pre-order it right now. <laughs> Liberated, the radical art and life of Claude Cahun. Now available for pre-order wherever books are sold. Anyway. Chances are high that you've heard this song, that you've done the accompanying dance, probably at summer camp or something. Surely it's just about how great it is at the humble, righteous establishment, the Young Men's Christian Association. Well, it seems that by apparently partial accident, according to the Village People founder, Victor Willis. Victor Willis, please don't sue me. I'm just a little guy. I'm just a little guy. You wouldn't hurt just a little guy, would you? Come on. The song transcended its original, more general meaning and rapidly became a gay anthem. The magnetism to the gay community of the 70s was already inherent in the group. A majority of the members of the Village People were gay and their very name is inspired by Greenwich Village, the neighborhood of New York City that was a famous gay enclave. It was in their branding and other songs too. Each member had a different costume, almost all of them referencing the hypermasculine style symbols of gay male culture. The cowboy, the construction worker, the sailor. Most poignant is the biker leather guy, almost a carbon copy of any Tom of Finland drawing. Even before YMCA, the group became famous for their other gay coded hits, Macho Man and In the Navy. So to those not in the know, what the hell does the YMCA have to do with gay people? people anyway. Well, actually, a lot, it turns out. For generations until around the time of the AIDS crisis, the YMCA served as one of the most central community and cruising points for gay men against its own wishes for the most part. But it certainly didn't begin that way. The YMCA, most originally, was formed in the 1840s in Britain and Northeast North America as an evangelical organization providing Bible study for young men. But over time, as they refocused their goals in the 20th century on fitness and family activities, the evangelical aspect of their structure faded away. I mean, most people today have only engaged with the Y through like, summer camps or a gym membership. So clearly for it to have such a legendary gay history, a lot had to have happened in the last nearly two centuries. Come learn with me. Quick disclaimer though, for brevity's sake, this video is going to focus mostly on the US and deal specifically with cis gay male history. I'm not really getting into the YWCA today. So a pretty narrow scope in this one, but that just means that we have so many more videos in the future to expand upon things. So let's get into it. But first, let's hear a quick word from today's sponsor, Kitsch. Finding hair products that work for me has been an uphill battle literally my whole life. My hair is very curly and somehow both dry and oily at the same time. It's looking pretty bad. <laughs> I decided to try using the Kitsch rice water shampoo and conditioner bars because I was hearing such good things and the difference in how my hair feels is nuts. Kitsch's Bottle Free Beauty helps you maintain healthier, shinier, softer hair after just one wash. Not to mention they're better for the environment with fully recyclable packaging, and Kitsch's bars are Leaping Bunny certified, vegan, and cruelty-free with no sulfates, parabens, or phthalates. The rice water in them has been long known to promote hair growth and strengthening, so not only is your hair stronger, but your scalp ends up less irritated too, as opposed to other products with harsh chemicals. I've definitely noticed noticed significantly less frizz too, even in the Chicago humidity. They also sent me the amazing shower caddy that sticks securely to your wall, holding everything you need for your routine, as well as this hair drying towel and their amazing pillowcases, which are literally the only pillowcases that I've been using for months because they're so great and help prevent breakage while you're sleeping. It's been such a relief to no longer be struggling with wasting money on a million products that don't work for my obnoxiously needy hair. Seriously. Use the link in my description box below and my code to get 25% off your first order from Kitsch. They ship in the US and internationally to over 27 countries, including Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and more. Also, they're available on subscription for an even better discount if you want to save even more time and money. Thank you so much to Kitsch for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to learning about the YMCA. <laughs> The 
first half of the 20th century saw a traversing of single men outside of their home communities like never before. Many of these men, of all ages and bachelors, made their way to big cities like San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, St. Louis, and New York in search of work and big dreams, or increasingly, because these cities offered the chance to find gay community that they could never have had in their rural hometowns. And when you're a new lad in the big city with not but a few quarters in your pocket, your main choice for lodging is at men's rooming houses, in particular places like the YMCA. Even men from within these big cities would surely prefer these bachelor rooming houses or hotels to living in close quarters with their families in tenements where they had no privacy. These rooming houses offered men a small room with minimal furnishings, but no kitchens, which meant that the gay men who lived in these houses created a parallel community in the world of urban cafeterias where everyone would go to eat. And you can imagine that this situation is an ideal one. It's easy to move out if you get into legal trouble, or if you happen to find a lover to move in with, and you have a semblance of privacy. And the ease with which a new man could meet other gay men in these houses was useful for being slowly guided into the city's queer underground and finding a larger community. Of course, none of these bachelor homes or cafeterias were built for the gay community. Rather, these places were a appropriated by the gay community over time. And in places like New York City, the community formed its own hidden map of the city, naming specific locations with cheeky titles like Vaseline Alley, the Fruited Plain, and Bitches Walk. Few places though, including the boarding houses, became as known and synonymous with gay life as the bathhouses. Bathhouses were fairly common in larger cities, be they public baths, Jewish community baths, or private bathhouses. A Russian bathhouse here in Chicago is still open after over a century. Places like that, which were less susceptible to the prying eyes of people who know you from your neighborhood, were a prime gathering spot for people to have um, dalliances. <laughs> from this, a number of specifically gay baths cropped up. A gay man named Thomas Painter recalled his experiences at the infamous Stotch's bathhouse in 1939. Coney Island has one truly amazing bath. It gives the visitor the impression of being exclusively homosexual. If one visits the roof, there is a spectacle of at least a hundred naked males, practically all of them homosexuals, with a few hustlers and kept boys about lying around in the sun. The more direct homosexual expression is reserved for the steam rooms. There, in an atmosphere murky with steam, so murky indeed that one cannot see more than a few feet ahead, with benches around the walls, fellation and pedication are not at all uncommon. If one stumbles over a pair in the act, one mutters a hasty apology and goes on quickly in another direction. Obviously, bathhouses that catered to the gay community were regularly raided and brutalized by the police. This was an era when sodomy was still a felony and degenerate disorderly conduct was a misdemeanor that could still ruin your life. I talked more about this in my video on LA's history of homophobia if you want to learn more about police raids. Fun stuff. But despite this persistent threat, bathhouses were still one of the safest places that men could express their queer sexuality other than in boarding houses or literally in an alleyway or a park somewhere. At the very least, bathhouses that catered specifically to gay men had managers that sought to deliberately exclude straight men. This considerably cut down on potential violence in the case that a straight man got flirted with and went beast mode. George Chauncey writes in Gay New York, it made it possible for men to disabuse themselves of negative feelings about their homosexuality, for although some of the other men at the baths might reject them as sexual partners, none would reject them simply for being homosexuals. It also meant that the baths became a rendezvous for those gay men who wished to have mutually satisfying sex with other gay men, rather than to service, quote, normal men. The investigators at the Ariston Baths in 1903, for instance, observed a scene that would have been almost inconsistent 
inconceivable to the fairies and, quote, normal men at the Bowery Resorts. Two men spent a considerable amount of time lying on the couch, embracing and kissing, and each played both active and passive roles. So it's no wonder that in safe spaces like these, many gay men frequented specific baths and created communities there, both with the staff and other patrons, over time creating what Chauncey likens to its own sort of closet, a large, very protective one with a whole gay world inside of it. That's not to say that there weren't gay enclaves in various neighborhoods. Of course, Chicago has Boys Town, one of the oldest gay districts in the country up near Wrigleyville, and New York City had Greenwich Village, and for a while in Los Angeles it was Venice Beach. But Harlem, known mostly for the incredible artistry of the Harlem Renaissance, was its own type of gay enclave too. Many queer folks at the time firmly believed that Harlem was the most open, most lively, and most exciting gay-friendly district in the United States. This is due in major part to the efforts of the black gay community that lived there, not the white visitors from other neighborhoods who were effectively tourists or slummers. Black gay men weren't allowed in the city's segregated bars, restaurants, bathhouses, and clubs, and thus their own neighborhood was all they had to work with. But while the white slummers and visitors saw Harlem as a safe space they could engage with their queerness without being caught by people who knew them, it was clearly less safe for the black gay community to be in the life there because it was their own neighborhood and they were far more likely to get caught. Black queer folks created this gay mecca despite that danger and became world famous for it too. The most famous gathering was the Hamilton Lodge Ball of Harlem, which attracted hundreds of drag queens performing for thousands of attendees. And a number of notable players in the Harlem Renaissance were in fact queer themselves. Bessie Smith, Ethel Waters, Ma Rainey, Gladys Bentley, Alberta Hunter, and many, many more. Cafeterias were one of the only public daytime places where the queer community gathered noticeably and visibly. With the increase in migrant populations and boarding houses, cafeterias serving inexpensive meals rose up too. The two most famous of these in New York were Child's and Horn and Hard Art. And on the West Coast, you had Jane Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco's Tenderloin District, the location of the actual first riot for gay and trans rights preceding Stonewall. Communities of all kinds used these cafeterias as nightly meeting spaces. In 1922, one migrant to New York named Mark Stanley remembered, after hours, you might say after the theater, which brought hordes of people together, Childs was a meeting place for gays and they would congregate and sit and have coffee and yak yak and talk until three and four and five o'clock in the morning. I was always there with friends, that was the social thing to do. Over time, a number of cafeterias became well known as fairy hangouts, where the more effeminate gay men felt free to congregate and camp, that is, act in an openly effeminate manner using queer slang, often to the deliberate amusement of straight patrons to Ooglat. They often sat by the windows where people on the street would gawk at them wearing makeup and long hair, literally letting their hair down. Some of these groups used cafeterias as a chance to test the limits of how much they could get away with without getting kicked out, accosted, or arrested. So long as they remained in known gay enclaves, they usually didn't run into too much trouble. But still, police raids, arrests, and assaults were ever common against any gay person who had the audacity to come in camping. But few of these places earned nearly as much enduring renown and legend status for the community as the Young Men's Christian Association. The YMCA was originally formed around the mid-1800s with the intention of giving male rural migrants to the cities a wholesome option for living as opposed to saloons and other unchristian establishments as the rise of the Industrial Revolution brought heightened concerns of vice and sin to the growing reform movements. In their goal, the YMCA believed that single young men staying at their rooming houses would find respite from morally corrupting influences and hopefully also take part in the religious activities 
activities like Bible studies and prayer circles. And these places were certainly much nicer than the average rooming house. YMCA houses had educational and job programs, full gyms, bathing amenities, libraries, food, and more. By the 20s, the YMCA was one of the most dominant residential systems for men in the US. But the YMCA's goal to be a center of Christian wholesomeness did not last. In fact, it didn't even last past the turn of the century. Within literally a few decades, the YMCA had developed a powerful reputation for being the place to be as a gay man if you want to, you know, get it on. Many even referred to it as the gay headquarters or a gay colony or joked that YMCA stands for why I'm so gay. I guess it certainly helped that the YMCA's had steam rooms, communal showers, and a swimming pool that permitted nude swimming, so similar digs to the bathhouses. It wasn't uncommon for men who presumed themselves to be straight to stay at the Y, get propositioned by another man in the showers, deny it thinking, that was weird, but I'm not gay. And then only a few days later decide, eh, one time couldn't hurt, have an absolutely slamming time with a rock and twink, and well, realize that they definitely weren't straight after all. Actually, this happened like a lot. You are. You are gay. Obviously, the YMCA higher-ups weren't exactly stoked about all this gay nonsense, but the extent to which the management at each Y tried to stop the gays from gaying kind of varied and usually was unsuccessful. Essentially, as long as you generally behaved yourself politely and didn't cause major issues, you were safe. It likely helped with a great deal of the men showing up at the YMCA specifically to engage in gay liaisons were servicemen, off-duty army and navy guys who were notorious cruisers. Many servicemen at the time noted that at some naval hospitals, both staff and patients would dabble in drag and openly chat about their gay romantic lives and sexual adventures. Sailors especially have a deep history here, which is a whole other can of worms that I'll inspect in a future video. <laughs> Two vice investigators were called. The Army and Navy YMCA was the headquarters of all <coughs> suckers in the early part of the evening. Everybody who sat around there in the evening knew it. The reasoning for this is deeply complicated, but a large part of it boils down to the fact that, much in the way that a rural young man was suddenly thrust into a new world with pre-existing systems upon moving to a big city, young men joining the Army, or especially the Navy, found themselves suddenly present in an all-male space full of men only just then exploring the boundaries of their sexualities. Chauncey continues in the history of homosexuality, many witnesses indicated they had at least heard of fairies before joining the service, but military mobilization by removing men from family and neighborhood supervision and placing them in a single-sex environment increased the chances that they would encounter gay-identified men and would be able to explore new sexual possibilities. And quite frankly, all men gay, straight, or anything else, knew that all they had to do to get their rocks off was go sit in the YMCA lobby long enough and some willing guy would inevitably come along. This didn't mean that servicemen were safe to be engaging in gay activity though, just because it was incredibly common. The Navy frequently employed undercover investigators to go into places like the YMCA, posing as gay men, and then soliciting sexual encounters with servicemen. Then those investigators would report back to the military court. It literally makes no sense. You tell these dudes to go have gay sex so you can charge servicemen with a crime, but the investigators who also had materially the same sexual experience didn't commit a crime? The hypocrisy of the whole situation became very apparent by the early 20s when the Bishop of Rhode Island and Newport Ministerial Union decided to cause a very, very, very public scene over the whole matter after two of their highly respected churchmen were targeted by these investigators. Not that they were doing this out of any compassion for the gays, they were just trying to protect the public integrity of the church. Their growing association with the gay community was not exactly a fun time for the why. They increasingly began to disavow any connection at all, especially as their evangelical focus on religion and missionary work faded out, so they could no longer hide behind that as any shield from criticism. 
Truth, a well-known trashy newspaper in New Zealand, published an article taking aim at the YMCA, stating, The YMCA does not attend to inculate robustness and virility in its young male followers, but develops instead effeminate and priggish sneaking mollycoddles, entirely lacking in all the qualities that go to make up robust manhood. They then went on to say that the YMCA stands for Young Men's Cuddling Association. <laughs> but any demands from Upper Y management to curb gay activity went mostly unsuccessful, in part due to the fact that many of the people who worked there were gay themselves, and therefore had a vested interest in keeping the Y gay. So what the hell changed? <sighs> the world after World War II was a very different place than the one before it. Not the least of which being that the parameters of the gender construct itself had shifted into the one we're grappling with today, but the post-war years saw dramatic suburbanization of the United States, and many larger cities like Los Angeles grew even larger as thousands of servicemen settled down there and started families rather than going back home to their rural towns, necessitating the rapid growth of American suburbia and a radical change in family structures. This impacted the YMCA too. For one thing, it was forced to open more suburban branches, which catered to the new need for family recreational facilities. So the focus was no longer on young single men at all, and neither was being a Christian a requirement for membership. Why don't you call up your YMCA and find out more about all this? The relation to religiosity ended in 1972, when the Y finally made a statement on their intention to support social justice and support the urban poorer classes secularly, a mission that only lasted until literally the Watergate scandal, when they shrank back again and refocused instead more on individual improvement. This meant that after its peak in the mid-century, the Y ceased to be a gay cruising center, and surprisingly, the gay rights movement had a lot to do with that shift. After the uprisings at Compton's Cafeteria and then Stonewall, the LGBT community organized like never before, and not only became a million times more visible and present in mainstream society, but it now became a point of intercommunity discourse on whether or not gay people remaining in the closet was actually hurting the greater cause. Before, it went without saying that you must stay closeted, you had no choice. It was a life or poverty or death situation. So the creation of an underground gay world invisible from larger society wasn't a choice. It was a necessity. But winning gay rights required a mass number of gay people to now refuse the closet, and it became a point of vicious contention for those who didn't want to leave the closet's relative safety, even if it was for the greater good. So gay organizations decided to make their own groups, community centers, openly gay bars, and other places to connect so that the Y wasn't still the only option. And it was increasingly becoming not an option at all, because the gay rights movement itself, along with a number of high-profile scandals at the Y, suddenly made regular people privy to the world of cruising. And with more and more families present at YMCA facilities, it simply became unsafe for it to be a place to fulfill erotic needs. This didn't stop gay men from grasping onto the Y as long as possible. In fact, in 1973, the Embarcadero YMCA went on sale, and there was a loud initiative from the gay men there to try and collectively buy it to keep for their own needs. The Embarcadero, a notably massive Y in San Francisco, was one of the single most most notorious cruising wise of them all, like practically legendary. The purchase was unsuccessful, however. Amidst all this upheaval, a particularly presidential scandal happened. N no, it's not Watergate. <laughs> Only a few weeks before the 1964 presidential election, Walter Jenkins, the closest aide to Lyndon B. Johnson, became the most famous homosexual in America. Well, no indication in any way. No. I knew him pretty well, and uh, he looked it also, and there was no suspicion, no indication. There are some people who walk kind of funny and so forth, that you might kind of think are a little bit off, but uh, also maybe queer, but there was no indication of that. Jenkins was very Catholic, very married, very a father of six kids, and he was arrested at the YMCA for having sex with a man in the changing room 
while a number of cops watched through a peephole. Jenkins was born in Texas, just like Lyndon Johnson, and they had worked together extremely closely for almost a quarter of a century. When he was arrested, no one realized what had happened because he didn't say a word about it. But of course, the world still found out, and Jenkins, more distraught over his fears of ruining President Johnson's career than his own, was placed on a 24-hour suicide watch at a hospital. Johnson, unsurprisingly, demanded that Jenkins resigned, and he did. It wasn't until Lady Bird herself publicly made a statement of support for Jenkins that the media showed him any mercy. All right, uh, I think if we don't express some support to him, I think that we will lose the entire love and devotion of all the people uh, who have been with us, or so drain them. Well, you get a hold of Clark and Abe and them and tell them how you feel about that, and see, you see what advice I'm getting. And I'm late now, and I'm going to make three speeches, and you can imagine what shape I'm in to do it. So don't create any more problems than I've got. Uh, talk to them about it. Anything you can get them to approve, let me know. All right. Uh, Abe approves of the job offer. Abe approves of the statement. What? Abe approves of the job offer. Of course, as you could probably glean if you watched my video on Eartha Kitt, this wasn't out of any compassion for gay people, but rather because Jenkins was her friend. Shocking, none of you, I'm sure. The explosive media circus surrounding this incident didn't exactly do any favors for the YMCA's reputation, which was only a few years off from a more mainstream awareness of its association with the gay community. Not that people didn't know before that. There were a couple of incidents in the 1910s, such as the Portland Vice scandal that put the Y on the proverbial gay map in public awareness, but such things were covered by the sands of time until Stonewall. The death knell to any of the Y's use as a gay center was quite literally the AIDS crisis. AIDS brought a massive decline to the public cruising scene for gay men, and it simply never quite recovered. AIDS brought an end to the organized use of bathhouses as gay meeting points too, particularly in 1984 when Larry Littlejohn, the founder of the Society for Individual Rights, proposed that the San Francisco baths be shut down to curb the epidemic. He was singled out in the community as a sort of Judas figure for this plan. They felt that initiatives like shutting down bathhouses would inevitably lead to more criminalization of gay activity even in private quarters. A number of men in towels went protesting declaring, Today the tubs, tomorrow your bedroom. Just the fact that bathhouses today are considered more of an occasional spa day for anyone rather than a cruising spot should be enough to indicate that these protests weren't successful and the baths never really regained their former glory. In 1992, something both surprising and unsurprising happened. The YMCA branches in Toronto and Ottawa, Canada decided to accept family memberships with gay families. Prior to this, queer couples were not eligible for the distinctly discounted family membership rates, so this change was a big move on the wise part and cemented a new angle in its queer history. It had only been just over a decade since the release of YMCA by the village people, which itself signaled something pretty poignant about shifting public attitudes of engaging with queerness. The village people was composed of several out gay members, and their characters represented six key figures in macho gay male culture. But their loud and proud image was fairly short-lived. By 1979, the advocate was already writing and mourning that something has happened to the village people. Big macho became Big Max. More of the counterculture caught up by middle class and straight America. Alex Midgley writes, While YMCA was written partly as a PN to the opportunities for gay socialization and sex that the YMCA facilities provided, nothing was ever made explicit. Audiences so inclined could easily interpret this song as an anodyne appreciation for the Y, an organization that promoted good Christian masculine values and responsibilities, rather than having anything to do with homosexuality. With YMCA, the village people became what gay historian and self-professed discologist Alice Eccles calls America's first gay-to-straight crossover group, that is, the first and only disco act whose image and original 
original following was gay but managed to cross over into straight discos. With their newfound audience, the village people, who had never shied away from discussions of their sexuality, suddenly changed tack, refusing to comment on their sexual orientations. <sighs> still, it's also true that while the group did shy away from their outspoken gayness, they still managed to successfully bridge an invisible gap between gay and straight cultures. They had straight people all over the world, many of whom hated gay people, singing a song about dudes f***ing sloppy at the YMCA. <laughs> Allegedly. It's like today when bigoted, like, thin blue line dudes are blasting Rage Against the Machine without realizing what machine the group is raging against, or like Fortunate Son by Creedence Clearwater Revival, or Christians thinking Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen is like a Christian worship song, but like, that's literally a Jewish man singing about sex and lust. Hilariously, Leonard Cohen, Credence, and the village people have forbidden Trump from playing their songs. So, uh. I know expecting media literacy from a lot of these people is kind of a big ask, but damn. Regardless, YMCA, the YMCA, and its storied history still persist in the cultural zeitgeist today in one way or another. The Y may no longer be a center of gay community, and frankly, we don't really have widespread ones anymore anyhow, but the fond memories of dudes getting sloppy toppy in the YMCA steam room under the guise of a nice, wholesome religious organization still lingers in the halls of gay history. Thank you for learning with me about the Y's role in gay cruising history. I think it's pretty neat how such a core institution that everyone has heard of or been to has such an interesting and unexpected history that frankly lasted almost a century. I ran a couple of polls on Twitter and Instagram just for fun to see if the Y still has some gay power, and from the looks of it, yeah, it does. <laughs> but that may just be because gyms in general are like kinda inherently gay, so... Let me know in the comments if you have been gay at the Y. <laughs> so, until next time, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and get shredded.